Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective, and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Dear colleagues and friends, both in Ukraine and worldwide, I'm Vyacheslav Pokatilo, and on behalf of MIMP Business School, uh, I'm happy to welcome you at Reinforce UA project. This project was designed in order to uh, intellectually support and inspire Ukrainian business community. And we uh, invited uh, uh, the most renowned intellectuals to share their views on most demanding problems the societies uh, and business are, are facing now. The project was made possible due to the general support of Bogdan Havrilshin Family Foundation, 50 Thinkers Organization, uh, and Global Associations of Management Education, AACSB, uh, AMBA, FMD, and CIMAN. Uh, before I shall give the floor to our honorable guest today, I'd like uh, to remind you uh, that you can ask questions at the end of the session. And for this purpose, please use Q&A button uh, uh, rather than chart. And now I'm really honored uh, to introduce Professor Amy Edmondson, who will speak today on the fearless organization. Dr. Mm -hmm. Amy Edmondson, uh, currently the Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management in the, the Harvard Business School, is a renowned figure in the study of human interactions and their role in successful enterprises. Her work emphasizes the importance of psychological safety and organizational learning in creation of thriving business environments. Having been consistently recognized by 50 Sinkers organization, uh, Professor Edmondson was ranked number one in 2021 and in 2023. She also received the Sinkers 50 Breakthrough Idea Awards in 2019 and the Talent Award, Talent Award in 2017. Notably, uh, she was named the most influential international thinker of human resources by HR Magazine in 2019. She's a prolific author, uh, published over 60 scholar papers and seven books, including Influential, The Fearless Organization, and the most latest, Right Kind of Wrong. The book was tra were translated in, in many languages, and, we, uh, and there is a uh, uh, look forward to appear many in Ukrainian uh, soon. Her experience in, three, in any sites have made her thoughtful, thought of the kind uh, keynote speaking in, in various global audiences. And we are very proud uh, to have Professor uh, Edmondson uh, today as our guest. Um, fear is uh, not a seldom feeling these days in Ukraine, uh, but it's uh, especially important, therefore, how to create a business and a business environment. Uh, where the fear is not so common as in the society. Professor Odinson, um, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, I'm uh, honored and uh, give you the floor for the presentation, which, uh, uh, which will be followed by, uh, by question uh, and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. And I am really, I feel a sense of, of privilege to be a part of this series and this community. Um, I enter this presentation with uh, sheepishness, meaning I know and, and um, feel such admiration and empathy and humility at all that you are going through. And I can only hope that there is still relevance in the kind of you know, interpersonal interactions that I am talking about that that I've looked at in different industry settings and yes, in different countries, but I have to acknowledge never in a wartime country uh, per se. So this is um, this is new territory for me. And let me just go ahead um, and I'm going to share um, some slides with you. Um, and just, I, 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 my aspiration is to tell you a little bit about the research in very managerial terms as well, but I'll tell you a little bit about some of the research I've done over the years. Um, and perhaps even why this research 
suddenly got very popular about eight years ago. And that popularity does not seem to have diminished much over those eight years. So I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you what I've done and we'll take it from there. I'll be very interested in your questions. So I titled the session Work Without Fear. Truthfully, I'm really talking about interpersonal fear. It is right and useful to be afraid of weapons. It's right and useful to be afraid of of enemy combatants and all the rest. I'm talking about your colleagues. I'm talking about the hierarchies that we all face at work and the natural inclination to hold back. I'll explain that in a moment and why it's actually um, possible and better to lean in with a sense of fearlessness. Bottom line, I'm talking about psychological safety and learning as prerequisites as imperatives in an uncertain world. Okay, so how did this get going? How did this get so popular? Well, it starts with a New York Times Magazine article uh, six years ago. Uh, no, eight years ago, I'm sorry. Um, and this is the title of the article, What Google Learned from Its Quest to Build the Perfect Team. New research reveals surprising truths, this is just quoting the article, about why some work groups thrive and others falter. Now, this long New York Times article went on to describe a three-year study that happened at Google, where a researcher named Julia Rosowski, I show her right here, uh, American researcher, um, studied 180 teams for three years. And what did she find? She found that the best predictor of psychological safety was a concept and a measure that I had developed actually 17 years earlier than this. Um, and my, my measure had been widely used in academic research, but it had not yet gone mainstream. So what Julia found was that psychological safety, which I'll define on the next slide, was the best predictor of performance differences between teams at Google. That made her interested. That made many others interested as well. So what is it? Well, psychological safety is defined as a belief that your work environment, your context, is safe for taking interpersonal risks. What's an interpersonal risk? Well, it's anything from speaking up with a crazy idea to admitting a mistake. It's asking a question when you don't quite know what to do. It's um, expressing a concern about a, a, about a course of action. It's offering a dissenting perspective. Not that these behaviors are easy, but that you believe they're welcome. You believe that this is the kind of place where we talk candidly. Now, um, that is, um, you might say, well, of course, that makes sense. Of course, we should talk candidly. However, psychologically, what we have found is that is not as easy as it should be or might be. Why not? Well, let's face it. And I think this is true even in uh, Ukrainian businesses. Nobody wakes up in the morning and jumps out of bed because they can't wait to go to work today to look ignorant, incompetent, intrusive, or negative? Of course not. All of us, and especially in a hierarchy, would far prefer to look smart, capable, helpful, and positive in the eyes of our peers and certainly in the eyes of our managers. And so, naturally, and more often than not, below conscious awareness, we hold back. Right? If I don't want to look ignorant, what do I do? Just don't ask a question. If I don't want to look incompetent, don't admit a mistake. If I don't want to look intrusive, don't offer new ideas. And if I don't want to look negative, don't criticize the status quo. So the point is, at a very deep level in social systems, holding back is second nature. Now, your parents may have taught you that this was being polite, and indeed it is. But at work, we can't be polite we have to be candid, we have to be creative, we have to take risks, we have to speak up. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is just tell you very quickly about two formal research studies that I've done, um, not Julia at Google, but two academic studies that I've done 
to show you a little bit more about the power of this variable, this construct. Um, and then I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about um, how you might create more of it where you are, uh, more psychological safety, more candor, more learning behavior. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and I'll give you some examples to back that up. And then we'll, then we'll have questions and answers. So the, um, the first study I wanted to tell you about happened in the hospital setting. My former student, Ingrid Nemhard, and I studied 26 intensive care units in 26 North American hospitals in the U.S. and Canada. And they were all actively engaged in quality improvement projects. Each of these little organizations, say 100, 120 employees, had four or five teams doing formal quality improvement work. Now, Ingrid and I measured, among other things, many other factors, we measured psychological safety. We asked, we asked clinicians, in this case, 1,100 clinicians, to fill out a survey on how comfortable they felt speaking up at work. And as you can see in the slide, the physicians who are the top of the status hierarchy in this environment had the most comfort speaking up. The nurses were next and what's called the respiratory therapists, a kind of focused technician, um, very important in that context, were the lowest. Now, this we did not, um, we were not surprised by. This was hypothesis one, that your status in the medical hierarchy would predict your psychological safety. But here's what did surprise us. When we looked unit by unit at all 23 of these little organizations, what we found was the sloping pattern was not consistent across all 23. In fact, in some of the intensive care units, it did not matter what role you were, you had the same exact level of psychological safety, flat. Flat and high, as it turns out, which means that in some of the other units, more than half, the pattern was even steeper than what you see here. Okay, so here's the important part. <laughs> Does that matter? Yes. In over the three years of the quality improvement that we studied, the, the units with flat, high, equal psychological safety had an 18% improvement compared to their counterparts in morbidity and mortality. That's death and harm. So lives were saved by people's perceived ability to speak up candidly and quickly. It sort of makes sense because of the complexity of and the dynamic nature of care, of delivering care in an intensive care unit. And so um, another question you might have is, well, what explains the difference? And that's what I'll do in the in the second part of this talk. I'll tell you what the what those special units with the high psychological safety did differently. But here's a quick one that I thought would be fun from a very different context. So this is a study with Henrik Bressman uh, uh, from, from INSEAD, a Swede. Um, we studied 62 innovation teams in the pharmaceutical sector um, all around the world. And they had, these teams had differences in expertise diversity. So some teams had more diversity of expertise, you know, chemistry, biology, you name it. And some were more similar to each other. Now, if I asked you, which teams would you expect to have greater innovation success? You would probably say, A, the teams with more diverse expertise. We know this, right? Expert, uh, innovation requires diverse expertise uh, to come together. And I would have predicted that too. But here's what our data showed. When we have all 62 teams in the mix, in the data set, there is a slight but statistically significant downward slope, which is exactly the opposite of what we predicted. So the more diverse expert teams underperformed the more homogenous teams. Wait a minute, that just can't be right. And so you're right. It's incomplete. And some of you are thinking, don't show me a regression line. Show me a scatter plot. Okay, I will. And now the plot falls into place. Um, what we see here is indeed 
as many of you may have predicted, only the more diverse teams had really a great chance of breakthrough performance. But unfortunately, many of them did not do well at all. So the, the range, of course, was much greater. So on average, the diverse teams underperformed the homogenous teams, but um, only uh, breakthrough innovation really required that diversity. So now we wonder, well, what is it, and you probably see this coming, that increases our chances of being in the breakthrough spot rather than the disappointing spot? And so now I'm going to color the dots red if they had one standard deviation higher psychological safety than the average in the 62 teams. And now we see um, a whole different story. Now we see that, yes, the teams with diverse talents had greater potential as we suspected, but they face challenges and without psychological safety, they are unable to uh, pull that diversity of ideas and talent together to create breakthrough uh, performance. So, so there's a kind of um, important thing to keep in mind here where psychological safety isn't the goal. It's, it's, it's one of the conditions that needs to be in place for you to reach your goals, whether those are innovation, quality improvement, um, uh, growth in, in, in revenues and sales, um, onboarding of new people. All of these very challenging, very learning-oriented tasks require us to build an environment where we believe earnestly that candor is welcome. So I think it's important to just point out that, as I just did, that psychological safety is not the whole story. Um, I will say it this way. Uh, many people hear about this work and then they think, are you saying I have to have psychological safety and I have to dial it down a bit on performance standards? No, I'm saying that as leaders, as team members, one of your responsibilities is to create an environment, an interpersonal environment of psychological safety. And the other important job is to create a performance environment of commitment to high standards. If you don't do either, well, I call that the apathy zone, right? This is where people quit and stay. They're just not, their heart isn't in it. Their head isn't in it. And this is Sure, this is if you had only uh, psychological safety, but no, no commitment to excellence, that's the comfort zone. But honestly, I see this one far more often than the comfort zone. I see what I'll think of as the interpersonal anxiety zone. I'm committed, I'm smart, I'm well-trained, but I just don't feel able uh, to speak up, to ask for help, um, to admit a mistake to point out someone else's mistake. And that is a dangerous place to be in an uncertain, complex, interdependent world. So this is where we want to aim. We wanna be where the commitment to excellence and the commitment to candor are both high. And if you're operating as you are, as we all are in a complex, uncertain world, then the learning zone is one and the same as the high performance zone. But there's just no, um, uh, we there's no way to get high performance in an uncertain world, in an uncertain environment without both, without a very strong performance environment and a very uh, safe interpersonal environment. So now I just wanna shift briefly to, well, how do you get it? Um, and I'm gonna offer my kind of, uh, <laughs> leadership toolkit, if you will. But please know that the word leadership in English anyway, um, is it's it describes actions. It describes things you do to influence others. The word leader is a role. <laughs> and and, and um, you can, it turns out, exercise leadership even when you are not in a leader role. And, and I just want to emphasize that because I believe any one of us can do things that help build psychological safety. So these are framing the work, inviting participation and responding productively. Um, I'll illustrate each one of them. Um, framing the work means calling attention to attributes of the work that require mutual learning. So what's an example of that? Well, as, as, as you may have heard, I've done a lot of research in 
in healthcare delivery, in other settings as well. But let's just look at one example from healthcare de delivery. This is Julie Marath. Uh, she um, was is a very respected leader in the field of patient safety. And when I studied her, she was the chief operating officer at a tertiary care medical center called Children's Hospital in Minnesota. And she came into that organization 24 years ago and found that it was full of people um, blaming and criticizing. And if something went wrong, if there was a, a you know an error or a problem with the patient, um, people were quick to, to, to point the fingers at each other and it never got better. And, and she said, you're thinking about it the wrong way. She said, healthcare by its nature is a complex error prone system. What does that mean? That means things will go wrong. That's a given. The only question is, will you speak up quickly enough for us to do something about them and make sure the patients are safe? So what she's doing is she's reframing the work in their minds before she got there. The work was just, if you're smart enough, if you're good enough, you'll do the right thing and all will be well. She says, no, doesn't matter how smart you are, how well-trained you are, things will go wrong. You know why? Because it's a complex error prone system. So she's helping them think differently about the work they do. And she's saying that when you're speaking up, you're not pointing fingers, you're saving lives. It's a, it's a very powerful reframe. Um, now, um, when you are reframing, um, it is it is helpful to think about the context, you know, and I, I'm just, well, I'll just, I'll quickly share this, right? Things will go wrong. That's for all of us, whether in healthcare or in science or in a, a manufacturing plant, things will go wrong, but context matters, right? So there are contexts where things don't go wrong very often, like in automotive assembly. There are contexts where things don't go wrong very often, but the stakes are high when they do, like the cardiac surgery operating room. And then there are contexts like the scientific laboratory where things go wrong all the time. Uh, so uncertainty goes up as we go to the right, which means, like it or not, failure rates go up as we go to the right. But all failures are not alike and all failures are not bad. I am primarily interested in, and as you will see um, in uh, my, my current book, which will be translated into Ukrainian sometime this year, um, I'm particularly passionate about intelligent failures. And these are, intelligent failures are those that explore an opportunity in new territory where there just simply isn't an answer, where you're driven by a hypothesis and you've kept the cost and scope as small as possible. And of course you take the time to learn from it. Okay, so the second quick thing uh, to say about building psychological safety, simply ask questions. Ask more questions um, than is normal. When you ask questions, it makes it very awkward for your colleagues not to respond. But make sure they're good questions and I'll illustrate that here. A good question is one that focuses us on the issue at hand that invites careful thought and it gives people room to respond. Some good questions help us go broad. What are we missing? What do others think? What other options could we consider? Who has a different perspective? You know, they are inviting the quiet voices in. Other good questions are the ones that help us go deep. You know, what leads you to think so? Can you walk me through your thinking? Can you explain that further? What might happen if these are the most powerful leadership tool there is to build psychological safety because they help people know that it's acceptable uh, to, to speak up. Um, finally, monitor your response. Respond productively. You must be oriented toward the future, toward learning. When someone brings you bad news, say something like, thank you for that clear line of sight. How can I help? Not, how the heck did that happen? Don't get angry, stay calm. Thank you for that clear line of sight. How can I help? Forward facing. Or just for fun, I interviewed an anesthesiologist at a cancer center here in, in the United States. Um, and if I ask you, I'll tell you what he said, how does it feel when someone points out your error? Most of us, if we're honest, will say it feels lousy. I don't like it. But 
Dr. Cohen says it is possible to train yourself to learn a new response. Now, as an anesthesiologist, uh, he says, um, and and he has 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 uh, sort of tweeted this this PowerPoint slide, which I'm going to share with you. He says, actually, it feels good. Now, really, he says, yep. I trained myself to equate someone speaking up with my error with patients getting better care. So it feels good. And also it makes me know that I've done my job right. I have been a good leader because I have made it possible uh, for people to speak up. So I will end here, which is sort of to really to build psychological safety so that people can learn and be excellent in an uncertain world. You are framing the work in a way that builds shared understanding of the complex, uncertain, or novel nature of that work and what it takes to do it well, why we need to hear from you. That's kind of a stance of humility, if you will, saying, I've never been here before, facing forward at an unknown future. Come from a stance of curiosity so that you will remember to ask good questions of your colleagues, of your subordinates, of everybody. And then finally, respond in a way that's learning oriented and future focused, which will happen naturally if you come from a place of empathy. So I am now uh, very much looking forward to your questions. Um, well, psychological safety is a tricky thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure because I need to ask good questions, only good questions, which, <laughs> which makes me stressed immediately. Um, good uh, questions I, are ones I, you don't know have the a answer. nice audience today and very active with, uh, with questions. Okay. I'm not sure we can cover all, but I will start with a few of mine. Um, mm, uh, that's that's especially let's say common um, uh, in our territory in our culture, uh, but I would make it uh, more or less American. You know, in, in a more historical perspective, if you look at the great managers of the 20th century, of the end of 20th century, we find among them uh, quite a lot of people who, let's say, softly not didn't care very much about psychological safety of of the employees, and one of probably the most striking, not striking, but a great example of John or Jack Walsh, uh, neutron, yeah. neutron Walsh, uh, as, it, as it was called, yes. um, with, with all his tricks about, you know, uh, uh, grading and yanking and firing uh, people, um, uh, um, considered, let's say, as, as a very successful, as, as a great leader. Yeah. What's your opinion? Will... Yeah. This kind of leader will succeed or yeah. have a possibility to succeed, succeed these years, and if if not, why? And if yes, what yeah. what actually well, changed? What changed uh, to not to consider this yeah. uh, working? Well, what what I'm I'm torn in how to answer this, whether to um, how much to focus on Welch and how much to focus on the broader question. And I I'll try to do I'll do Welch quickly and then the broader question. Mm -hmm. Um, which is more important. Um, one of the things I have certainly been delighted to see is that the um, um, Welch's reputation has taken quite a hit in in the 21st century, and not just because um, the world has changed and different now, but because, in fact, as as researchers and journalists look back on what he did that gave him so much credit and so much success, he was... Uh, very explicitly, or not not out loud explicitly, but but very systematically mortgaging the future for the present. Uh, so much of his financial, much of the financial success that GE enjoyed came from came at the expense of its future success, and that's now very well established. I won't try to do it justice here, um, but there's a magnificent book that I have read called "The Man Who Broke Capitalism," and it's explicitly about. Welch and the way they approached and even turned um, many of the great industrial powerhouses into essentially financial services companies that mortgaged their future. Right? So, but but more broadly, I mean, more generally, this issue. Uh, yeah, but what about the sort of the tough, you know, command and control um, uh, manager style? Um, the the person who does not want to listen to input, the person who um, is convinced that he is the smartest 
person in the room and just says my way or the highway, as a American phrase goes, um, um, sometimes it looks like that's working. The data suggest that that can work in one of two conditions. One is an extremely predictable, you know, where where the where the relationship between um, uh, you know profit and um, and process is very very clear cut, right? It, so long as you do it this way and exactly this way, we will be successful. Those kinds of contexts are fewer and fewer. Right? We just don't see. You know, it's it's harder and harder to find companies where that where there's sort of one person who's got a brilliant idea, and if everyone else just does what they're told, will be profitable for for over time, right? It just it, it's hard to think of those, and 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 that brings me to the second part, which is the, the there are many cases I cover them in the fearless organization where it looks like that's working. Martin Wintercorn at VW, it looks for a while like that style is working. And then it comes out later that the apparent success of the company was in fact an illusion of success, um, that it involved a lot of hiding uh, and cheating, meaning uh, developing software to cheat the regulators because the technology wasn't really ready uh, to pass in, in the emissions standards. So, and, and this happened at a, a very famous uh, bank in the US, Wells Fargo, where that style leads to people not speaking up when they have a problem and then it looks good for a while, but then later it comes out. So final, you know, the bottom line is if your environment, your business environment has uncertainty, has a need for problem solving, a need for innovation, you simply will struggle to succeed without people's willingness to bring their hearts and minds to work fully. Thank you. Metrics is important. I agree 100% about this. And uh, well, we have a very active uh, audience today, but I will ask uh, one more question from myself uh, related to findings of, of your colleagues from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, Adam Grant, published yes. a book. Uh, and uh, based on his studies, probably it's not the first time you, you, you got this question, <laughs> published the book that, uh, you know, uh, takers, uh, so-called, those who uh, don't like to share very much uh, their findings, information, they're not very supportive to the team members. Actually, uh, on uh, statistical, let's say, okay, there are certain exceptions, but statistically, they actually leave behind uh, givers uh, who yeah. uh, uh, somehow yeah. um, participate in trying to help uh, others, etc., which create a certain, let's say, dilemma or trade off uh, uh, yeah. to choose either to uh, uh, have a very great ideas and then uh, on the very top you can again uh, win according to the same uh, research but in general uh, statistically uh, you will have less um, let's say salary etc uh, certain things how would you yeah. command this and what what yeah. uh, well, what what's your opinion about this kind of it's individual versus team you know, in my um yeah in my work um and in my field you know many people and i'm not one of them study careers and career success and individual success. I'm one of the ones who studies organizational success. So I'm I am primarily interested this isn't a you know a good or a bad it's just a difference. The questions I want to answer are how can um, your team or your organization um, be thrive or even your nation how can how can you thrive into the future? And when you take that as your question, um, you get a different answer than when you take, okay, what's going to get you the highest salary, you know, in the near term? It, is, is it worth it? With my students, I will often say, we are prone, at least in the United States, to confuse getting ahead um, with success, right? Getting ahead is a kind of success, but making a difference is also a kind of success. My favorite quadrant is where you are getting ahead and making a difference, you know, where you're where you're having personal career success, um, and um, it is not at the expense of others. It is not as a taker, you know. It is it is as a 
team member, you know, or a member of a larger group that matters to you. And I think ultimately um, we may be able to show differences in salary, but, you know, ultimately the people who find themselves in their work lives in the upper right quadrant here, where they have both truly made a difference and for others uh, and gotten ahead with some success in their life, they will have more uh, meaningful, full, and enriching lives and relationships that I think is the kind of real wealth that that most of us deeply want. Great, Johnson. Thank you. Um, I, I will switch to to questions from from those who are online and choose uh, us uh, uh, instead of. Uh, uh, they, they they probably love uh, love uh, love. That's a good word. <laughs> love yeah. management management and and, and those studies uh, and uh, not only physical love uh, on this uh, Saint Valentine's days. Uh, there are a lot of questions that I, I need to pick up. Uh, and my colleague asks very important for Ukraine. Uh, would would be applied the same concept for military teams? Uh, relevant today in Ukraine, especially when a lot of civilian people were drafted and get military teams with today different organizational climate. And it is not about war threat, it is clear. Question whether uh, is about the nature of strong military leaders, which with yes. little uh, to no tolerance to mistake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, your comments yep. uh, or advice? Yes, so a couple of quick important things. I, I have um, every year I have um, military officers in my class, and sometimes I also teach whole programs of them. Um, and and so I'm quite familiar with the context and um, with what the wiser leaders will say. Um, even Stan McChrystal's book is very interesting on this point. But the, you know, um, Point one is do let's not um, confuse the right to make the call, you know, to make the decision with the need for input. So uh, a strong leader in the military context um, must be interested in hearing from people because he or she knows they will be missing things. They do not have omniscience. And so they will they will basically, but, and they have the responsibility and the authority to make the final decision, which won't, it's not going to be a vote and it won't always be popular. What they do not want to do is make a decision that is uninformed, right? That a member of the team or the regiment could have told them in advance will not work. And military history is full of bad decisions that not bad in retrospect, but bad a priori because people were afraid to speak up. So the strong leader in the military context says, I need to hear from you. Uh, I am not omniscient. Um, and when I make the call, it will be, uh, you know, it, it will be final and we will, we, we will do it. And how can I help? And so it's the, it's a strong stance, but it's a stance that recognizes human limitations and the desperate need uh, for, for input. Thank you. Uh, I, I will not follow a, 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 any scheme, uh, but this is a nice question about words safety and 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 openness. You know, candidness. Uh, you know, candid people uh, uh, should feel a little bit unsafe. Obviously, yeah. And, you know yeah. Uh, uh, how to manage all this uh, yeah. uh, this, yeah. this type of of, of also trade off. Yeah. You need to risk to become yeah. candid. You need to, to risk to work in team. It's very thoughtful. It's a very thoughtful question because language fails us or fails me um, because the term psychological safety was one that was already in the literature. Um, and I think it has, it, it implies whether you like it or not, a sort of comfort that it should not mean, right? So what, what, it, what it means is not that it's easy or risk-free. In fact, it means that I can take the risk with confidence that I will not be rejected, that I will not be humiliated, embarrassed, punished in some way, right? But while I'm taking it, yes, it feels very risky. It feels very uncomfortable. You know, if I'm going to speak up, I'm a nurse and I'm going to speak up to the surgeon and say, that's the wrong side. You're about to cut into the wrong hip. Um, 
I promise you that will never feel comfortable or easy. But I am confident that my surgeon expects that from me, right? Because of the work that's been done around here. Because, you know, a moment of sort of interpersonal awkwardness is so much better than a patient with an injury on the wrong side. And we all know that, we all agree to it. Um, now that seems like an extreme example, but it's it happens all the time. So um, so it's it's um, please know I am not saying psychological safety means you would just feel it's easy to do these things. You will always feel that little bit of uh, anxiety and adrenaline and um, but you you collectively believe that's how we roll. This is what we do around here because of what's at stake, because we care more about the mission than about our comfort. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for answer. And it is important. I, when I was preparing to this meeting, I also thought about this. Um, you know, comfort is not equal to safety. Comfort is no, different. No, and, not, is. And, and we should not look and seek for comfort zones uh, for no. us. Uh, this will break the business and not to be mislead with this. Yeah. Uh, another question, which is, uh, uh, I would reformulate it from, from the audience, because safety in business, it's very much standardized kind, uh, kind of matter at the moment, you know, normal safety. What, yeah. what, what was safety. considered to be what worker yeah. safety, etc. Right. Uh, standardized means a lot of measurement, etc. Yes. Yes. Uh, and you, uh, I, 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 I take a privilege. Uh, you showed us a couple of charts uh, and and data, so you are not <laughs> against data. How to measure uh, uh, safety and uh, psychological safety at work at teams? And one of the questions of uh, yeah. of uh, from the audience as well. Well, there is a there is a, a, a validated survey measure um, with seven items. You can find it on fearlessorganizationscan.com. You can use it; it's free. You know, you can use it with your team. Um, but the but but um, and many research studies don't use all seven. It still works, right? It's it's um, you can use three or four, and it's usually just fine. But the um, but more more casually. Um, you can also, um, you can think about and, and notice, you know, the degree to which people seem to be willing to take risks. If you So, you know, if you, if you don't want to go so far as to use the measure, which I'm, you know, I'm in favor of measures, but it, it's also something that you can kind of take stock and say how much, uh, you know, how much bad news am I hearing versus good how, how many times am I hearing people asking for help versus saying, yep, all's well. And if you're not hearing <laughs> enough of the red and it's too green, it's probably not enough psychological safety. Well, uh, I was thinking how it would look like, you know, near miss, near miss in psychological safety. <laughs> That's right, funny thing. right. Funny thing. Okay, another question from a different field. Also, I reformulate a little bit from the audience. Uh, uh, it it's about um, our, um, let's say, not inequality, but our, at the moment, struggle to find a common a common basis, you know, political, ideological, cultural, everywhere, and not only in, in, in the US, by the way, everywhere in the world everywhere. at the moment. Yeah. We, we have our own story, uh, very tough at the moment. Um, uh, how in this kind of situations, when we have people, you know, uh, uh, how, so very distributed, very um, um, driven by their views of what is right, what is wrong, uh, uh, making business together anyway. Yeah. What's from your experience, yeah. from uh, from your yeah. lectures or whatever, what would you recommend? How to, to start uh, uh, not building at least not, uh, uh, not, not, not yeah. uh, full safety, but at least try to move towards yeah. it? It's very hard. And so here's where where I will emphasize and underline skill, right? So, it, you know, psychological safety describes the emergent property, the emergent interpersonal climate in a group of some kind. Um, and that's a, that's a great environment to have if you want to do hard things together. But it also takes skill. Um, several years ago, um, I wrote an article with my friend and colleague, Diana Smith, called Too Hot to Handle. And it's it's an article about how to have productive conversations about 
about divisive topics. Now, it was not at that time, we weren't looking at um, political or social um, disagreements. We were looking at business teams, executive teams, you know, disagreeing um, energetically and profoundly about strategic decisions or which way to take the firm. And um, the problem with that is that sounds like, okay, you just work it out. It's logical, right? But when we disagree with people, you know, strongly about things that we truly believe are right, we get emotional. We we begin to make attributions about the other person that are distinctly unflattering, right? So there's no, you know, that's very. It's it doesn't stay logical, right? It becomes um, it becomes personal, and so we describe the skills that one needs to manage these difficult conversations. And they are roughly um, sort of self-awareness and self-management, a kind of emotional intelligence, if you will, to recognize when you are getting hooked in something that is not, it's just, you're not likely to be helpful and productive in bridging that gap, uh, you know, to, to learn to pause and challenge your automatic assumptions and beliefs and and get a little more curious and caring about the other. And of course, it helps if they're doing that too. The second set of skills relates to having productive conversations full of inquiry, full of careful explaining of, of I see it this way because here are the data that I look to. What am I missing? You know, a kind of a more balanced and data-driven conversation. And the third competency we describe is called um, managing relationships, taking the time to build genuine connections and relationships across our big divides, right? So in the U.S. right now, of course, between, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats, um, if you can, if you can take the time to say, well, uh, I certainly don't agree with you on this policy, but here is a, you know, here's a human being with you know, families and so forth. And just building a little bit of that connectedness helps us do this well. But none of what I just said is easy. You know, all of it takes a commitment and a genuine desire to want to engage in mutual learning and conversation with each other, but too hot to handle. It was in California Management Review. And um, I, I, I learned a lot from Diana in writing it. She's very skilled. I'm very academic. So it was a um, it was a great experience for me. Thank you for recommendation as well. Um, uh, we need to, not to come back, but you mentioned the failures and mistakes, and it is important to... Oh, uh, yes. No, 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 no. It is important to, uh, let's say, come back and to explain, because one of our um, uh, participants asked... Uh, I, I just said, and do I understand correctly that teams that make more mistakes but worked in the psychological safe environment were no. more successful? No. Okay. No, but no, please, no. Please, no, please no, explain no. Because, because, because it could, could, yeah. could come like this. And therefore, yeah. no, no, your no. explanation is no. important. No. Teams that report more mistakes. Yep. Right. Okay. Let's just assume everybody's a human and humans mm -hmm. will make mistakes. Now, when we're at our best, we can, we can minimize those. I can talk about that all day. But, um, now, mistakes will slip in, right? They will. We will accidentally make mistakes now and then. When they get hidden, worse things happen. When problems are not caught and corrected in a timely way, they grow bigger. Right? So what my data have shown is not, we, we certainly don't want teams who make more mistakes, but we want teams who are willing and able to report the mistakes they've made so that they can fix them in a timely way so that they can perform better. Um, and, and so what you what you often will see is if you're trying to, one study I did um, where it was a study of predicting mistakes, turns out we had a serious reporting bias, right? We didn't know how many mistakes were being made. We only knew how many mistakes were being reported, but it's easy to mistake the those two, right? It's e When you get the mistakes reported, you might think those are, perfect data they're not perfect data in most cases thank you uh, i believe that it is important uh, not not to mislead uh, mislead uh, our audience yeah um, uh, uh, a little bit about you know this comfort and and safety 
and the um, natural trend and, and the eagerness of people to remain in a comfort zone. Uh, and um, the question is, um, uh, what, what to do with these people if they, they don't want to move towards this learning, uh, a bit this most stressful uh, environment, uh, which could be healthier, uh, which means uh, safer, uh, but uh, it, uh, it affects uh, um, well. uh, our organization. You know, there, there's no, um, that's the, that's a question as old as humanity itself, I think, you know, there's no, there's no simple answer to how do you motivate people to want to change, but the, the general formula, I think, or the general approach is, um, they need to see that that change will be in their best interests. And so, so this is part sales and part creating the opportunity for them to, uh, learn and shift things so that they can be better. But the sales part is some variation on this is the goal. This is the, you know, this is the, the, the purpose or the mission or the goal that is meaningful to us. And the only way to get there is if we, you know, change certain aspects of our processes or our behaviors. Right? So it's not, um, nobody ever wants to just change for change's sake, but most of us will change for something that we care about or believe is meaningful. I mean, imagine, you know, when when uh, a young uh, couple has their first child, everything, you know, the things that they never would have thought would be attractive in their life, not going out much, you know, are suddenly attractive. And they're, you know, they've changed everything because they're very motivated uh, to change because of this new new baby in their lives. But uh, so it has to be, you know, you have to find the thing that makes it worthwhile to them. You can't force change. You can only, it's like the push doesn't work, the pull works better. Thank you. Again, uh, come to this uh, a little bit cultural issues uh, uh, related to what is strong manager? What is weak leader or what is weak leader and uh, how not to show weakness? And uh, <laughs> one uh, possibility to show weakness is not to, yeah. let's say, um, uh, be tough and um, uh, be strong uh, with those who made mistakes. And uh, what would you recommend those uh, leaders who want to be strong uh, and yeah. not to lose to lose their yeah. uh, their their uh, 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 renommee? Yeah, well, first of all, I think there's enormous strength in vulnerability. And by vulnerability, I don't mean weakness. I mean um, truthful recognition that um, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't see the future. Or truthful recognition that you do not have the power to magically you know, change the world. Right? So it's a, you know, in a sense, we are all vulnerable to whatever it is that life or the global environment is throwing at us. We are vulnerable, that's simply a fact. The question to me is, are you strong enough to say it? Or are you weak and you try to cover it up? So here's what you ask, your, what, what, what I think is often the case with leaders is, you know you're fallible. They know you're fallible, but they don't know that you know close that gap, right? When you can close that gap, um, you will be more effective and you will have a certain strength. Uh, my friend Tomas Chamorro from Yuzak and I wrote yeah. a piece um, last, uh, two years ago, I guess, that just got selected for a special issue of HBR uh, called Why Leaders Need um, uh, Vulnerability, Not Bravado. You know, because bravado is a kind of fake, fake masculinity that ultimately doesn't work very well in a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world. Uh, by the way, he was the first uh, lecturer on Reinforce UA, uh, and uh, you remember him, his lecture. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. And well, I agree, it was a great answer. Well, it is uh, just be strong rather than uh, be strong in eyes of of somebody. Uh, uh, that that's important to see. We have only a, a few minutes left, and I remember that you would need uh, relief to shoply. Uh, I'd I'd like to ask uh, 
Uh, during all this, you know, long research you made and met, met a lot of people, etc. What surprised you most during all this research? What was the, the matter which, which actually st strike, stroke you uh, uh, and, and changed probably something? I, well, I, think, um, I think the surprise, and it continues, is that, uh, is, is the difficulty people have business leaders especially, kind of letting go of outmoded assumptions. Um, you know, and so for example, the assumption, many people just have the assumption that the relationship between effort and success is straightforward. You know, if you try hard, you'll get a success. If you don't try hard, you'll get a failure. When in reality, if you try hard, and you're in a scientific laboratory or in a battleground, sometimes it won't go your way simply because of the nature of the beast. We, so we have to learn to realize that you know, the, even the best effort will, in the face of uncertainty and complexity, sometimes fall short and learn to welcome the data, you know, welcome the news truthfully rather than wish reality were otherwise. So people still have what I call industrial era mindsets that are governing their behavior that don't work very well, and they struggle so hard to change it. That's a great example, but I'm a little bit surprised that it surprised you. You have a bachelor degree in, in architecture and work as a chief engineer. Yeah, you started yeah. your career as a chief engineer. Uh, well. What, what did you brought? Uh, uh, what did you bring from 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 this well, that background to psychology and, I and, think and all? I, that's probably part of the problem for me is that you know <laughs> when when I did my calculations correctly, the geodesic dome would stand up, but and if I didn't do them correctly, it would fall down. So, but but human behavior is so much more complex. Um, or or unpredictable, or you know what's complex about it is the interaction effects, and and so I think we struggle. You know, we still think we we live in a Newton world in our mind. We we struggle to kind of really appreciate complexity, dynamic feedback loops. You know, it, and and this is just we, we maybe aren't wired to do this well, so we need to support each other in developing the mental models that really work in an uncertain, complex world. That's a great answer indeed. Uh, uh, we really indeed not wired properly uh, to, to face this kind of complexity. Yeah. And then and then yeah. we need the support of uh, one another. Uh, I uh, It was a really great pleasure, Professor Edmondson, to have you on our project and to participate in this in this lecture. It was a, a, a memorable, memorable event and i remind everybody who uh, who were with us these days that uh, the record of this uh, lecture and uh, and discussion uh, will be available on the website of the project and also on youtube and other channel and other platforms uh, where Mimi is present and our project continues uh, and our next session will be on 28th of uh, of February, and we shall meet a politician. We have a member of the uh, parliament of uh, Germany uh, and speak about infrastructure and logistics, which is which are important matters for, uh, for Ukraine particularly. And for today, that's it. And uh, there's really a, a great appreciation. Uh, uh, thank you very much for finding the time uh, to be with us uh, today on this day. My pleasure. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Valentine's goodbye. and goodbye, everybody. Bye. See you in two weeks uh, on Wednesday. Goodbye. Bye bye. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com.